Um, welcome again to Guild and to another microservices meetup. We're always very, very happy to be uh, hosting this uh, meetup here. We've had some really, really great talks in the past, and I'm sure it's not going to be any different tonight. We have two talks, and for the past meetups, I think we had one only, and tonight's going to be a bit different. We have two. And a couple of things first, I'd say. Um, so, pilots, if you haven't seen, it's here to my right. We have here at the back, if you haven't noticed. And um, Pizza will be here at a around quarter to eight, but thereabouts. So, our first speaker for the night, we have Paul Mooney. Paul's going to be talking about uh, microservices with uh, .NET and RouteMQ. Great, hey. Um, it's my first time here, so I'm going to get into this nice and slowly. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, so, my name is Paul Mooney. Um, I currently work for Ryanair, and um, I've been involved with microservices for a couple of years now. So, essentially, this talk is going to center around uh, .NET and RabbitMQ. So, uh, effectively, by way of a brief overview, uh, well, first of all, I'm not a microservice expert in any capacity, so uh, I'm not here to preach or anything like that. Um, as I said, though, I've been involved with it for a number of years, baptism of fire type thing, so um, I'm effectively here to, to, to share my adventures, if you like, so agree or, or disagree, as you will, as I go on, by all means. Um, by way of a brief overview, uh, what I'd like to cover tonight is, um, first of all, Microservice design based on some real world examples. There's no, uh, there's no theory in this, in this presentation at all. It's all practical stuff. Everything I'm going to talk about is actually running and working in production in some capacity somewhere. So um, I'm going to go through that uh, in detail and uh, we'll focus on, but it won't be restricted to .NET and RabbitMQ. Um, I'm talking to a couple of, a couple of you guys there. You know, there's a lot of Java, Scala, Ruby, and a little bit of Go here. So uh, a lot of this stuff will still pertain to that. It can be abstracted out. Uh, there'll be stuff that's solely focused on those two technology stacks, but um, for the most part, it applies to, to any given technology stack within the context of microservices. And I'm going to briefly move into their design patterns then, specifically the design patterns that are, I suppose, but, uh, form a fulcrum of, of microservices, uh, decoupled middleware, circuit breaker, and then uh, one interesting one called the flyball governor. Um, after that then we'll move into some implementation problems that um, myself and my team have experienced over the years, uh, which you might find interesting and how we overcame them. Uh, first of which is consistent message delivery, and then uh, load balancing a RabbitMQ cluster, which uh, is not as straightforward as it may sound. Finally then, uh, so that's all technical to begin with, um, I'll wrap up briefly then by um, going on to the software side of things, which is selling microservices to the business, which is um, obviously, uh, depending on who you are, where you work, can be a, a trivial or a, quite a tangible task, but um, basically I'll go through my experience in that regard and hopefully it applies to you. So, um, as I said, to begin with design patterns, uh, essentially microservice architecture, the, the quintessential design pattern is the decoupled middleware pattern. Um, in its simplest form, uh, we have effectively, again, within the context of .NET here, we have a, an ASP.NET application, which consists of a dispatcher, message dispatcher. Um, message dispatcher obviously dispatches message to input queue based on a microservices. Um, I've named this here simple math microservice. My blog, uh, I talk a lot about this stuff on my blog, and I always refer to a uh, simple math microservice by way of example. A uh, simple microservice that performs one function, which is to um, basically double any given number. So you'll see that lot here, just in case anyone's wondering specifically what it is. In any case, simple math microservice has uh, two components, similar to mirror the uh, ASP.NET model, which is a receiver to receive the message, and a dispatcher to dispatch the result. So essentially the process flow is Dispatcher on the ASP.NET side receives a request. That request is pushed into an input queue, input within the context of the microservice, and the microservice has a receiving component which dequeues that message and consumes it and processes it in some capacity. The message itself then um, will be processed, whatever business logic is in place will apply, and uh, a result will then be output by a dispatcher to the output queue, which is listened to by the ASP.NET service. Okay, so that's the 
I suppose the quintessential, I'm not sure what the, the, the experience level here in microservices is, so if I'm, if I'm boring people, just raise your hand and I'll, I'll move swiftly on. This is all fundamental stuff and a little bit more advanced, cool stuff, but uh, if not, uh, I'm just going to ease into it gently as it were. So, um, uh, straight off the bat, where people are probably think, well, hold on, it's not that simple, there's a lot more to it. Uh, I'll get to that shortly, but uh, this is, I suppose, the canonical example. So, if we extrapolate that out a little bit, um, again, we've got microservice, still on the decoupled middleware pattern. We have a microservice daemon, generally some sort of a self-contained process, generally, uh, for example, in a Windows environment, we're talking about an executable file, such as a Windows service. Um, so again, here we are, with a message dispatcher, message goes to queue number one, that message is consumed by the opposing microservice, process dispatch across the service bus. Uh, service bus obviously being the um, the unit by which both uh, microservices communicate with one another. So effectively, the, the, I mean, the, the couple of middleware is all about shock absorption, really, and um, it's all about interfacing two components or more than one component that uh, were never meant to be interfaced before. So it provides a common level of um, abstraction in that regard. Um, generally, we experience uh, generally they're asynchronous. So uh, one of the great things I've experienced anyway, I'm not sure if you agree with microservices, is we effectively achieve parallelism to a great degree without having to dive into the very complexities of applying parallelism in the various languages. You know, um, each one of these microservices runs within their own bounded context. They're effectively doing their own thing with their own OS threads and so forth. And uh, we can achieve all of that without having to dive into the complexities of multi-threading and so forth, which is which is great. Okay, so that's about it for the decoupled middleware. I'm going to move swiftly on circuit breaker. Uh, the next, I suppose, quintessential pattern in terms of microservices. Again, we have a client, doesn't matter what the client is, initiates a request, and rather than go directly to our microservice, we have a filtering layer here, and a circuit breaker in the middle. The circuit breaker effectively uh, counts requests that come in. So uh, this request happens to be a request one of n, we'll say. What happens is the circuit breaker kicks in, and a uh, very simple logic is invoked, which is to say that if the request count is less than the threshold, uh, so we have a predefined threshold, which is let's say we want no more than 1,000 messages at any given time or 1,000 requests per second per, through our circuit breaker, that request count there will be set to 1,000, such that if the request count is um, less than the threshold, or rather the threshold will be set to 1,000, such that if the current request count, if this will say request number 50, less than the threshold, it's allowed through and uh, processed by one of the various microservice features as normal. If not, on the other hand, obviously uh, the request count is greater than or equal to the threshold, so in this case we'll say greater than or equal to a thousand messages, then that request will be rejected and handled in some graceful manner by the initiating uh, by the circuit breaker and processed then in some sort of a meaningful manner by the client. I mentioned briefly earlier uh, the flyball governor pattern. Um, so, like, what the hell is that? Um, the flyball governor is something that uh, myself and my team have come up with ourselves to facilitate a specific problem. Uh, first of all, a flyball governor or a sensor viewable governor is a mechanical instrument that exists in the real world that is designed in order to regulate the flow of any given fluid through any given mechanism. Uh, for example, there's one in your, in, in your car to regulate the flow of fuel. Effectively how it works is, uh, as you can see, there are two uh, oscillating balls here, each one on um, extending arms. And what happens is, as uh, liquid comes in here, it fills up slowly, and uh, the uh, oscillating balls are raised, the arms interlock until they get to a certain point where they lock completely, at which point the valve at the top here is closed completely, uh, preventing any more liquid from coming in. Uh, similarly, then, as the liquid is drained from the bottom, the, 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 the arms come closer together and the, the valve is released allowing more fuel. And the point being that uh, you want uh, any, at any given time some fuel coming in through the mechanism uh, but you don't want it to reach a certain level either. So what the hell does that all mean within the context of microservices? Effectively what we want to achieve with this or what we achieve in terms of um, ultimately this all leads to auto scaling. So what we have, what we experience with a flywheel governor pattern is the load never drops to 0% capacity, simply because 
Um, as the uh, as the offside and the arms come down, they always let more fuel in, uh, or in the case of microservices, they let more messages through. So um, that will happen generally before zero percent. So we never experience that. And similarly, we never uh, we never experience load that rises to two or above hundred percent. Now, when I say hundred percent, this is all predefined by the type of uh, by your configuration. So, for example. For a previous example, it might say 1,000 messages per second is, is 100% capacity in this case. And what we effectively achieve is um, automatic balance through polling, which I'll get to in a minute. Now, what this requires, though, in order to implement, is requires detailed tuning to establish the optimal setting. The reason being, you don't really just plug this thing in and let it run and everything's going to be fine. And you have to sort of, I mean, what, you have to determine what 0% is, what 100% is. Uh, well, to be fair, 0% will generally be zero messages, but 100% could be anything depending on your needs, requirements, hardware specification, and so forth. And uh, as anyone who's implemented microservices will be familiar with, there's a um, no plug and play uh, concept, really. Everything is um, heavily based on environments and so forth, and has to be rigorously pushed in order to determine optimal configuration settings. But the end result of the flyball governor pattern is that we achieve auto scaling through a natural type of equilibrium. Basically, the, the, the microservice instances will balance themselves out and provide uh, their own scaling as needed. So, let's then, let, 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 let me just step through a quick, I suppose, abstraction from a design perspective. Yeah. RabbitMQ has a management interface, an admin interface, and this admin interface provides key metrics in terms of RabbitMQ itself and its uh, performance at any given time. So, for example, we can see the amount of messages coming in to RabbitMQ, the amount being published, the amount being processed, the amount being dispatched, the amount of messages that die, and so forth. Any metric really pertaining to uh, messages coming into RabbitMQ is captured there. So, what we've come up with is a .NET library called QWatch, and effectively what QWatch does is it will poll the RabbitMQ management interface, which uh, receives, which exposes metrics in JSON format. So let's say, for example, we've got uh, any given queue. We'll say a queue called inbound queue, for argument's sake. We can poll that and get metrics pertaining to it at any given time. Those metrics tell us if the queue is either uh, based on quality of service or QoS. If anyone's ever done message brokers, you'll be familiar with that term. Basically, QoS is something you want to achieve 100 percent. You want all your microservices to be running as an near 100 percent of the time, as much as possible. Otherwise, you don't want them sitting there idle or really waste, wasted resources effectively. So. Again, what QWatch does is effectively uh, a regular interval pulls the RabbitMQ admin interface, pulls back information pertaining to all or any given queue you like, and will tell you basically whether or not the queue is being underutilized. So an underutilized queue, for example, might be a queue where there's no messages or very few messages coming in. What happens then is um, there's a chain of responsibility that's involved, a chain of responsibility in terms of design patterns. Uh, so what will happen is a number, of, a number of business rules will kick in. First of all, we'll say, okay, is the queue empty or is the queue full? Um, is the rate at which messages are being dispatched to the queue greater or equal to the rate at which they're being consumed by a microservice at the other queue? Obviously, if, um, if the microservice is consuming messages quicker than they're being put onto the queue, well, it's probably, um, it's probably it's probably, uh, it's probably idle a lot of the time, or conversely, if, uh, if the microservice is um, backlog, if the backlog is building up and the microservice is pulling messages off the queue slowly, more slowly than they are being invoked or pushed onto the queue, well, then um, we probably need to scale out. So the end result of this is QWatch is that uh, for each queue, we get a, um, either a scale-in or a scale-out directive based on those metrics from RabbitMQ. So, our microservice, let's say microservice the one here, is um, running as, as normal. Uh, it has an inbound queue and an outbound queue. It receives messages on the inbound queue and pushes results to the outbound queue, which are consumed by uh, a client somewhere. The whole uh, the design, or the, the, I suppose the key concept behind the flywheel governor pattern is that it, each, each microservice has its own diagnostics queue. And that diagnostics queue is unique to the microservice and is known by QWatch. So, for example, if QWatch determines that, okay, well, microservice one here, um, there are 100 messages per second coming onto the queue, coming onto inbound queue, but um, the microservice itself, the, the dispatch rate or the, the, the consumption rate is only um, 
we'll say uh, we'll say 50 messages per second. So in other words, 100 are coming in at any given time per second, or 50 are going out. So we're experiencing backlog. So microservice one is um, over capacity, in which case. There is a, a small service, a small uh, listener running in microservice one. It's listening to diagnostics queue. Queue watch has determined now that microservice one is over capacity, so it sends a scale out message to the diagnostics queue. Microservice one has its own dedicated thread, which is listening to diagnostics queue, consumes the message, and scales out appropriately. So when I say scale out, I mean these microservices in .NET are essentially it's a Windows service, a Windows service that encapsulates the service itself, and uh, upon uh, as, as a basic bootstrapper, when the service runs, that uh, invokes at least one instance of microservice one. That microservice sits there and does work. So uh, it's the Windows service itself that's listening to diagnostic queue, and if it determines that microservice one needs to be scaled out, what it'll do is it'll kick off a dedicated thread, and uh, a foreground thread from an operating system perspective, and run another instance. Remembering that the uh, microservice one itself is basically uh, an infinite loop, okay? It's, it's, it's effectively sitting there listening to the queue. And um, because of the nature of this, again, there's no contention here in terms of resources, unless you're dealing with some sort of flat file or, or, or some sort of file system thing. Um, if, you're, if, you're, if you're simply reading over a database or communicating with some downstream RESTful API, there's no risk of race condition or anything like that. So again, as I did earlier, we experience, I suppose, the benefits of parallelism without the complexity. Um, and as I said, QWatch is bound to all uh, inbound all queues basically in the system. So effectively, microservice one, two, and three here. The same applies to all. QWatch determines okay, inbound queue here, which is pertains to microservice one, is uh, under capacity. I'm going to scale that in. Whereas it's over capacity, uh, inbound queue for pertaining to microservice two is over capacity. I'm going to scale it out and so forth. What we have, what we achieve then, is basically auto-scaling microservices that will scale out as and when, as and when needed uh, in their own time without the need for manual intervention. Of course, the problem with that is we don't, um, we can't really trust the system to adequately, adequately scale out and scale in itself because we may experience a sort of a, a bounce effect. I mean, for example, what happens if there's um, a hiccup in the network or some sort of uh, delay where QWatch doesn't actually return anything for a couple of seconds, given some sort of TCP, TCP um, contention or something to that effect, and then all of a sudden it returns several metrics one after the other consistently within the context that are within, let's say, a, a very small time interval of one another. So it might say, okay, inbound queue here is over capacity, so I'm going to uh, scale this out. As soon as we scale it out, then it goes, oh, wait, now it's under capacity, you can scale it back in, out and in, out and in, and we get this bounce effect. So, Again, when all things related to microservice, it requires extensive testing. So we need to define our interval here. We need to define how often we need to uh, expand the queue. And we also need to define a percentage, effectively, which is what QWatch does. QWatch also will, say, will allow microservice to say, OK, this queue, uh, I'm microservice one, I'm listening to inbound queue. But I, I'm over capacity here. I need to scale out. But um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to allow myself a threshold, we'll say, 20%, 10%, 5%, whatever, uh, whatever, whatever is deemed necessary. So in other words, what happened is okay, it will say, okay, it's it's only about 5% uh, over capacity based on the last run, so I'm, I'm going to leave it be because it's not too bad. Whereas if we start to get to 10, 15, 20, or whatever number pertains to your particular situation, uh, then, okay, now I'm interested, now we'll scale that. So essentially, uh, it does allow the developer the um, I suppose the luxury of being able to, first of all, configure all this and, and, and how it's going to behave. It's not just a black box type system. Again, though, it does require uh, extensive, extensive testing. And so essentially, the fiber governor pattern is uh, very similar to the decoupled middleware pattern, as you see here, but effectively what it does is it turns this into this. So, again, with our ASP.NET application, by way of example, dispatcher, input queue, and now we have multiple receivers, potentially, depending on the load, depending on the, how busy input queue is. And similarly, the dispatcher, we can scale those out accordingly as well. And uh, we achieve then instances, so the, the, the client is, is none the wiser effectively, nor does any um, developer, DevOps engineer, or otherwise have to manually intervene at any given time. Incidentally, Fireball Governor, as I said in the beginning, is a mechanical instrument. It won't, uh, each one of your cars has one. It's also called a centrifugal governor. Uh, you may have heard the expression, uh, right, lads, we're going we're gonna to go at this thing balls out. 
Well, that's where that phrase comes from, effectively. <laughs> it re refers to the, the, the two oscillating balls on the, uh, the arms of the five ball governor. Okay. So, from a C sharp perspective, then we can uh, also express, or we can design microservices in terms of more traditional interior application uh, structures. So, for example, with our web browser here, as you can see, we've got a web server here, which is what's called Web1. Um, I'm not sure how easy it is to see that. Uh, I'll just run through it briefly. So, we've got a message consumer, message parser, which, uh, depending on the, the, the format, would be JSON or, 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 any, or um, any other format. It comes in, uh, the API itself, and then we've got our uh, request mapper where we need to obviously uh, determine what the request is. So it's, it's a request to get data, delete data, add data. That mapper has to be pointed to some sort of a function downstream to achieve that. And then we've got our dispatcher as well. So by way of example, if we step through this quite, uh, quite quickly. So the request comes in. Uh, in this example, we're actually using SignalOR. So this is a SignalOR design. Again, this is in production running uh, for a US education company. Um, so a SignalOR request comes into the API, processed over AMQP, rabbit AMQ, and then uh, what happens is effectively uh, the request is mapped to a specific function. The function is executed, and uh, the response message is parsed and built, and pushed back to input queue, and then that response is sent back to uh, one of the very bigger part of this happens in the microservice there, the response is then sent back to the queue, back to the API, and in, real time, in, uh, in terms of uh, web, from a web software perspective, then push back to the browser. So again, a more sort of, uh, I've been talking very abstractly here about some more, um, some of the fancier concepts of microservices, so this I suppose is more of a fallback to a more traditional model. So I mentioned earlier that, that covers the design patterns section of the talk. Um, I mentioned earlier that uh, I go through some real world problems that uh, my team and I experienced. So the first of two is uh, consistent message delivery. How do you achieve consistent message delivery across AMQP, but specifically with Rabbit and Q? I mean, let's look at the problem first. Uh, so we've got uh, we've got our users here, ASP.NET application messages come in at any given, uh, I suppose, arbitrarily based on uh, however many users are currently logged on. So they're processed in by a simple Mac microservice, again by way of example, and the uh, outbound queue then handles the messages that are consumed by the ASP.NET app and sent back to the user, which is all great in theory. But how do you control, for example, RabbitUp queue, we don't have any uh, guaranteed message delivery. So. As you can see here, I've just color coded these uh, so they can be visually represented. So I've got this uh, blue message, which is the first message that, come in, that, that comes in. Yet, as you can see, it's not the first message to leave. In fact, the, I recognize that's the last message to come in, whereas the red message is the first message. And what have you, ideally, what you want is the red message to come in first, but as you can see in this case, um, the green message here is processed last, whereas it should have been processed second of the three. So our ASP .NET application is uh, going to have some trouble determining that, and uh, user A may, may receive user B's response based on that. So, I mean, how do we how do we tackle that to achieve consistent message delivery? Because bear in mind that the ASP .NET application is simply each worker process is effectively a thread that's listening to an, out, uh, an outbound queue or, or a response queue. It doesn't know the difference, but it's not aware of any other threads that are currently executing. So. What we could do is, well, we could take, a, we could, we could have each process assigned to a specific queue. Because that sounds like a great idea. I mean, we've got uh, three messages coming in here. Again, users, ASP.NET app messages coming in one, two, three. Uh, okay, they're processed by the Mat service in an arbitrary order based on how they're delivered, and we have okay, we now we've solved the problem here because um, ASP.NET app. Pertaining to user A, which sent in the red message, is listening to this queue here. Similarly, user B, blue message, this queue here, and user C, green message, this queue here. So we are only ever going to get uh, the correct message per queue because they're predetermined, predefined. Of course, that all, again, in theory, is great, but not very practical because, uh, I mean, if we have thousands of messages coming in, we can't very well invoke uh, thousands of queues and where do we stop? I mean, you know, we could say, ah, well, let's just spin up a, a super large Amazon instance and have um, a couple of thousand queues, which is great. I mean, where do you come up with that number? And uh, how do you manage that? And that means now you have to keep track of all those queues. Those, those queues are effectively tightly coupled to your application. And uh, if anything happens to a rabbit up queue or an instance of dies, for example, it comes back up, those queues are all dead now and they have to be re, uh, re instantiated, which is obviously a logistical nightmare. So it's not the most optimal solution. 
Not to mention the fact that, um, I mean, from a memory consumption perspective, you don't want to be creating a specific queue for every request. I mean, if every request that goes into an ASP that an application creates a queue, which is effectively, uh, obviously, it's a logical construct, but I mean, it's 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 a um, it's a fairly memory heavy component in terms of AMQP, specifically rapid and queue. So creating one on the fly is uh, is not what you want to do. It would be better if those queues already existed and were available for consumption as we as and when we need them. So the solution that we came up with was um, again the, uh, the, the, the the similar to the centrifugal governor concept uh, that was invented incidentally. The, the the flywheel governor was invented in the eighteen hundreds by uh, by somebody smarter than me. So far be it for me to reinvent the wheel. Similar to this, uh, how do we achieve consistent message delivery? The, we've come up with the concept of queue pool, which is very similar to a connection pool concept. Anyone um, familiar with database programming will. Well, no, a connection, a connection pool is effectively, it's um, in order to serve, to, to save memory, you have a, an in-memory construct which as connections are created. So uh, the first user logs in, it's a new connection, when he's done with it, uh, that connection goes into a, into a pool and is available for consumption by any uh, subsequent requests. Again, uh, all configurable, you can define the, 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 the maximum length and so forth of a connection pool, and queue pool works in a very similar manner. So again, if we set through the process flow here, what we have is our uh, user base here. Again, very, very the same as before, same ASP that an application. Now, instead of um, the first step here, instead of just taking the message and pushing it onto a queue somewhere and expecting it to be consumed, logic uh, consumed in a consistent manner somewhere, or dispatched to its own unique queue, we, uh, for a previous example, first thing we do is we go to the queue pool and uh, we say, okay, uh, I need a queue. I've got a, a request here and I need a specific queue. So what QPool will do then is uh, QPool will go, okay, let's see, um, we have currently, the ladder. one of two things will happen. The ladder say, okay, uh, number one, we don't have any queues available, in which case I'm going to create a queue now and give it to you. Very same with a database connection. You now if there's no database connection available, one is created, given to the user, and uh, this queue is dedicated to that particular ASP on your request. And no one else will use it, that is uh, absolutely thread safe. So now, this request has its own dedicated queue, whether it was created or pulled from a pool. Uh, so now what we do is we uh, fire we fire off the message. Message comes down to RabbitMQ, is pushed through a queue, and comes down to Simple Math Microservice, which processes it accordingly. Simple Math Microservice is part of that part of that message. Uh, the queue pool, the, the the specific name of the queue will be embedded in that message, so microservice will extract it out and push it to that specific queue. And uh, again. A queue will never be used by any more than one instance at a time, any more than one thread from an OS perspective, or any more than one HTTP request from an ASP.NET perspective. Request net now, let's say a uh, very simple example. It was the, uh, that user was the only user on the system at that particular time, right? Okay, so he then, uh, his connection goes back into queue pool when the connection is or when the request is complete. User two comes in then and says, okay, I have a request here, I need a queue. Queue pool goes, okay, that's fine, here you go. You can use this when we prepared earlier. So essentially the first couple of users that log into a system are going to experience a slight delay as queues are created, but as queues are built up, um, subsequent users will experience actually greater throughput. Again, all configurable, so you can define your queue limit and so forth, depending on your hardware constraints and so forth. But uh, so that's the queue pool concept, and uh, we found it a very effective mechanism to achieve consistent message delivery across AMQP-based solutions such as RabbitMQ that uh, don't guarantee message delivery or integrity necessarily. The last uh, real-world example I'd like to talk through is uh, load balancing a RabbitMQ and how do we achieve it. You might think, uh, okay, let's put a load balancer in front of us. Node 1, Node 2, Node 3, great. Uh, we've got a round problem or at least common uh, policy here, which is going to route messages appropriately. Uh, that's not actually the case with RabbitMQ. If anyone's in it, uh, 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 if, you have, if you've worked with it before, you'll be familiar with what I'm talking about. What happens is, at any given time with RabbitMQ, there is a master node and um, zero or more slave nodes. So you create a queue that's going to go on uh, the master node. If you're allowed, uh, let's say the master node is node 1 here. So we created a queue called Q1, and our client application needs to use it, needs to push a message to it. So it hits the load balancer, but the load balancer, for whatever reason, decides to push to node 3. What happens is, 
it's node 3, then rabbit up queue, oh wait, that queue is not on node 3. Uh, in this example, I beg your pardon, the queue exists on node 2, we'll say. So node 3, rabbit up queue goes, well, that queue doesn't exist on node 3. Uh, it exists on node 2, so I'm going to route you back to node 2. Now, the client won't experience any error or, or, or any specific um, undesirable behavior, but under the hood, there will be an extra network cop here, uh, number 3 here in red which is uh, obviously not ideal, because it will ultimately um, add to the level of overhead. So, I mean, what's the, the solution? Well, we can, uh, we can define an application level and say, okay, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to increment these or, or, or give them a unique name, so I'll have, instead of Q1, I'm going to have new Q1, new Q2, new Q3. I'm going to explicitly install them, or configure them on node 1, node 2, node 3, respectively. I'm going to ignore the load balancer, and uh, with my client application, my client application is going to uh, know exactly where they are. So, um, for example, by way of example, I have a randomizer here. The client application will go, okay, it could be either node one, two, or three. And the randomizer will randomize between the th between the three, and will return a value of either UQ one, UQ two, UQ three, and then will uh, be routed to the appropriate node, and there will be no um, interference by rabbit and queue. So again, this requires your application to be uh, cognizant of your underlying queue infrastructure, which isn't exactly from a design perspective a good thing. So we abstract it out to a queue metadata store. The queue metadata store is effectively a key, uh, from, I suppose from a JVM perspective, a hash map or a .NET, a dictionary or any other language. Uh, effectively, it's a key value pair store which stores where the queues are, what nodes they live on. So the client application will on, uh, on startup, basically, uh, pull a list of these back, or, uh, or on demand, pull a list of these back and determine, okay, I have a message here, it's going to um, Q1, and okay, refer to the metadata store, I know that's on node 2, so uh, I'm effectively going to go there, and uh, as you can see, no, no, uh, no load balancer whatsoever, whereas we can achieve balanced load across all our RabbitMQ cluster, uh, cluster nodes without when it's superfluous network hops, network hops, that's the first example. Yeah, that covers the, the technical side of things for the moment, so I'm going to um, roughly, I'm going to very quickly run through, because I'm conscious of time, um, I'm going to run through selling microservices to the business, if anybody is interested in that. Um, again, this is um, real world examples, this is none, of this is, uh, none of this is abstract or theoretical. Um, this is how, for example, we solved the concept of implementing microservice design to Ryanair and um, a, a big US education firm. So, let's consider the old monolithic flow. So we've got our web application, it's a big monolith, black box, and uh, effectively the client says, I want to book a flight. Okay, well here are all the available flights. Okay, I want to book one of those flights. Great, would you like to hire a car too? Etc. 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 The problem with this is immediately it's one-way communication. So the customer is in complete control. Effectively, the website is idle when the user is idle. So if the customer is sitting there doing nothing, the website is doing nothing either. So effectively, from a, from a business perspective, we have a limited window of opportunity to interact with the user. We have to catch them on the fly every time. And uh, I hope you know, a user comes in. I just want to book a flight, and then I want to get the hell out of this website. We have to kind of hook onto that and go, oh, hey, look, do you want to book this and that and the other and throw stuff at them when they probably don't want that to happen. So uh, I suppose the scope of opportunities to interact is very much reduced, which reduces then the, the potential for ancillary revenue or revenue outside the concept of buying uh, or selling plane tickets. From a technical perspective, then again, I found personally that uh, one of the hardest tasks is also selling to engineers as well, selling to the business for whatever reason. Um, a couple of things we've gone through in order to, I suppose, soften the blow is, uh, first of all, their monolithic architecture tends to result in dependencies. Failure affects everything. Big monolith it takes a hit and goes down, the generator takes everything with it. Of course, in practice, that can obviously be absorbed and diffused, but it's not as versatile as microservices, effectively. Um, change is slow, effectively, as we all know. Uh, scale is relatively expensive, so minor feature, some sort of minor upgrade update requires unilateral scale, uh, requires a new build, the whole thing has to be redeployed generally, or at least one major part of it. 
steep learning curve. New developers that come in, they have to take apart the entire system using massive code bases. You're talking, uh, uh, for example, in, in uh, if you have Ryan here, you're talking at least uh, uh, 10,000, or between 10,000 and 100,000 lines of code, all of which needs to be learned, a big ball of spaghetti. Technology stack is then limited to specific skill sets. If you have a monolithic application that's written in Java, well, you can only hire Java people or else people who, um, who skill set revolves around the JVM, so the .NET and so forth. Whereas with microservices, obviously, that's not the case. You, know, you can deliver each microservice potentially in a different language technology if you like. One thing I've experienced as well, uh, which I don't know where people are from here, but um, we spend, I spent half my time dealing with lawyers. And uh, there's a lot of legal pitfalls, especially when you're dealing with uh, large volumes of money. Uh, uh, PCI DSS compliance is, uh, I suppose, the major bone of contention in that regard. You can't just write code as you would. There's a very specific process that has to be adhered to in terms of um, the code you write, how you write it, how it's logged, uh, the deployment process, continuous integration, and so forth. And the rule of thumb is that if anyone, if any given component has any sort of a direct whether it be virtual or physical interface with another component that handles, uh, for I suppose a simplistic example, is a lot of money, and then that component comes within the context of PCI and needs to be locked down and um, development uh, on a PCI enabled component is very, very slow. So, in other words, with a monolithic application, everything is adjacent to one another. So, effectively, if, you're, uh, if legal compliance applies to you, well, then it generally applies to the whole application. Whereas with microservice architectures, that can generally be abstracted out across bounded context and so forth. So other, other sections of the application can generally be developed, deployed, maintained, and upgraded outside the context of anything that may pertain to some sort of legal scrutiny. And finally, the monoliths generally are more rigid. They're likely to break under pressure, whereas microservices, again, are generally able to absorb shock a little bit more efficiently. This isn't apply, this isn't a general rule of thumb, incidentally, you know, I mean, obviously monolithic applications out there that don't exhibit this behavior, but um, this is me selling to a lot of engineers that, uh, that just don't want to <laughs> uh, take on this new challenge. By way of example, if we go back to uh, five booking systems, in this case Ryanair, We've got various microservices now, so we've split our monolith, which was a big ugly black box before, and now it's microservice based on flight, taxis, others, car hire, user profiles, hotels, fare finders, etc. etc. Um, so now we've got our flight, our user has asked for flight information, so we give it to them here. The flight microservice goes, okay, I'm interested in that, I'm going to send you back that information. Now the taxi mic the flight microservice has pushed the message back to the queue. The taxi microservice has picked up on that message. He's, I wasn't, he wasn't interested in that before, because the user just asked for flight information. Whereas now he is, he's, hold on, that user has just, uh, has just received some flight information, okay? Uh, he's received flight information pertaining to Dublin to Heathrow, for example, or Stansted. Right? Well, I'm interested in that. Maybe he wants to get a taxi to Dublin Airport, or maybe he wants to get a taxi from Stansted to wherever he's going there. So now I'm going to kick in and start pushing metadata to the client. Now car hire is interested as well. So, hold on, now flight and taxi are interested in this, so I'm going to start pushing my stuff to the, to the to UI as well. Hotels, uh, fare finders, other fares, and so forth, etc., etc. Um, in other words, we've got effectively uh, communication that's going on outside the context of the user's interaction. Remember, the user's just looked for, asked for a few flights here. Um, so flights kicked, uh, that, that information has been returned to them, but now our microservice, without being invoked specifically by the user, are all kicking in and trying to sell the user things in real time. From a business perspective, the benefits you get of this are uh, we effectively achieve two-way communication. So, uh, as you can see now, the, 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 the microservices are now responding without being asked. Incidentally, uh, this does require some form of WebSocket or some sort of signal or slash type uh, asynchronous communication mechanism on the client so that this information can be received and, uh, and parsed and displayed on the UI as it's received. Again, business benefits, two-way communication, and we're in control. I mean, think about uh, Google. Google take this to the, um, I suppose, the ultimate level, uh, where they log every single event that you do. If you move the mouse in a specific way, it's logged. If you move the mouse up, down, left, right, if you uh, tap the keyboard, pretty much every type of manual, uh, physical interaction you have with your peripheral device, be it keyboard, mouse, touch screen, is captured by Google. They capture everything, um, and they use that to build up all their 
all their metadata about you. So uh, effectively gives them control, it gives them a greater idea of who you are. And similar, that can be achieved, not to that scale, not to that scale necessarily, but uh, microservices are, uh, I suppose, a step toward that direction. The APIs as well, they're always working. I mean, if you think about a typical monolithic application, if it's uh, if no one's logged in, nothing's happening, or, or if people are logged in but they're they're only using specific elements of the system, you have a lot of dead weight. You have a lot of um, services that are wasted, uh, you know, resources underutilized. Whereas um, our APIs can potentially always be working, always be computing. Uh, every time a user does something, we can react to it in some in some capacity. I would encourage capturing as much information as you can uh, as well. Uh, it, it might seem important as mo uh, to begin with, but eventually, you know, you might uh, go through your Hadoop cluster or so forth, wherever all this stuff is going, and say, oh, well, actually, now we can, you know, potentially use this uh, this stuff here, which we've never thought about before, to, to monetize it, which is all great. But again, gives us a broader scope for ancillary revenue. Um, from a technical perspective, to, 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 uh, to, to wrap this up, uh, obviously we've eliminated Dependencies to a greater degree. A failure can be isolated. You know, one microservice dies, it can be isolated and uh, not necessarily have an impact on its adjacent services. So, as well, we can react to change quicker. If I skip quickly back, let's say uh, we need to upgrade our user profile. Okay, well, that can generally happen from a continuous deployment perspective outside the context of any of these services. So, in theory, they can all still run while we're upgrading our user profile uh, microservice. Which means Scale can potentially be less expensive with the API scale individually. A more intuitive learning curve, for example, um, I'm a new employee, just joined here, I come in, I've been asked to look at the uh, user profile of microservice. It's generally going to you know, be a lot more straightforward for me to get my head around that than it would be if I were to dive into some sort of enormous monolithic code base that um, you know, the, the guys who wrote it have been gone for 10 years. So we can also shield ourselves if we're, if we're, uh, if we're, if we're I suppose, savvy enough about things, and they're going from the legal pitfalls, potentially. And uh, we effectively then have a, load of, uh, a set, a suite of reusable components that are flexible and generally bend rather than break under pressure. So, just to wrap things up here, um, if I could offer any advice, again, I'm not an, uh, an expert at this, but I've uh, waded through the swamp, as it were, <laughs> and any advice I can give is, first of all, Log everything, log everything, and then log it again. Because um, when stuff goes wrong with this, this kind of these kind of frameworks, it's very difficult to determine what's actually happened, how to debug it, especially when systems are distributed. Unless, unless you have uh, pretty decent logging in there, you're going to spend a lot of time uh, with tools like WinDBG and uh, in, in, into, the, into the garbage collector itself and so forth. You're looking at memory dumps, which nobody likes to do. One other uh, piece of advice I would give is if a framework exists, use it. Um, there are pl plenty of frameworks out there now. I mean, we were talking earlier on, and uh, we were talking about the Play framework. Um, from a C sharp perspective, there's the ACA.NET framework and so forth. If it exists, use it. And uh, try to avoid what, uh, what you might refer to as the technical swamp. It's very easy to dive into all this stuff and think, oh, this is all great and cool. I'm going to tackle uh, consistent message delivery, I'm going to tackle um, dead letter messages and so forth. Try to design up front from a minimalist perspective and grow it from there. You know, um, anticipate these problems, but uh, don't over-engineer it. Otherwise, you'll uh, end up with in, in, in a world of hurt. Okay, so just to wrap things up, then again, my my name is uh, Paul Mooney. I work at Ryanair. Uh, my blog is insidethecpu.com. I've blogged about microservice extensively on that. Um, if you just, if you're interested. If you want my blog, search for microservices, there's a uh, half a dozen or so articles there. There's obviously also, uh, I don't have it up here, but there's a uh, Visual Studio magazine has a couple of articles on it. And uh, my Twitter handle, Stoichisystems, that me, that's me. And uh, my GitHub profile, actually, there's uh, a library up there called um, AMQP for C Sharp. If anyone's interested, again, uh, there it is there. And um, LinkedIn and so forth. I'll be around for a little bit after this, anyway. I'll have a beer if anyone's interested in chatting, but uh, I don't know if we have time for a couple of questions. Great job, so. Uh, great presentation. Thank Thanks. You. Uh, I, would, I would just like to point out that in terms of scalability, especially for those with applications, I've used uh, Azure Cloud Services with uh, Azure uh, queues that offer um, scalability out of the box. So, you set up a, 
a service and you say, okay, what's this queue? And you configure uh, how the instances will be multiplied according to that queue's uh, load. Uh, plus the queues are, uh, are not uh, are, are auto scalable, so it's, it, uh, it fires up instances on the background, so the queue doesn't need uh, any extra handling for uh, uh, dot, dot balancing or anything else. Cool, cool. Uh, that's uh, Azure queue service, is it? It's uh, Azure storage uh, services, and uh, queues are part of that service. Okay, cool. So basically what you're saying is I've wasted uh, dozens of hours of work putting this stuff together <laughs> for nothing. <laughs> I don't need to help you. Yeah. Well, that's great. Thanks very much. I'll certainly have a look into that. Um, with the, one of the reasons, uh, I mean, I must admit, uh, my team and I, when we put this stuff together back in the day, it was as much to learn microservices um, as it was to get the pro uh, working software to production. And the reason we went with Rabbit MQ is because it's uh, simplicity. I mean, you've got options like uh, we, we also looked at, for example, AWS, SQS, and so forth, which offers similar uh, auto scaling features. Uh, the Microsoft, the Azure stuff, I don't think was out when we looked at it, but we, 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 we certainly considered those options. Whereas I think it worked out at uh, something like a dollar for every, for every uh, 10,000 messages on the SQS. So uh, we went with Rabbit MQ simply because it was really easy. It was written in airline, you just click install, next, 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 it's there, you have a lovely management information. And uh, we all learned um, <laughs> AMQP from it, uh, Baptism of Firewise. But uh, certainly, thanks very much, I'll, I'll definitely look into that. Thank you. Cool. Anybody, any, uh, yourself? Okay. Uh, before you were talking about scaling out with microservices, you were talking about scaling out inside one host app, inside one machine. It's like with scaling the machines, out, it's out of the... Yeah, I beg your pardon, sorry, uh, thanks for bringing that up, I, I, I should have specified that. Yes, uh, talking about scaling out within the context of um, a single executable. So, um, the, it doesn't actually scale out the machines or the hardware that it's running on, or, or the VM, or, or any, anything pertaining to the hypervisor. It's uh, specifically in Windows, in Windows environment, a uh, Windows service, and uh, that service basically can scale out uh, each one running on its own dedicated thread. Um, again, the limit of that is uh, depends on the hardware, depends on the, the, the load, depends on how the, the workload that the microservice has and so forth, but uh, that all needs to be predetermined through stress testing and so forth. But thanks very much for pointing that out. Yeah, it's uh, specific uh, within the context of a single um, resource machine. Thanks. Uh, so you said you have uh, essentially request threshold, and when you go over that, you essentially reject requests. So first question is how do you define that threshold? Second question is why can you not just scale up your fleet before you reach the threshold? Okay, well first of all, um, we determine that number again by stress testing. We're spending a lot of time with tools like JMeter, and uh, we, what, we do, what we generally tend to have is we, we, we know in advance, or at least when we built this stuff, we knew in advance how many users we wanted to cater for. So what we would do is we would start out with our baseline level of performance, which is what we absolutely needed to achieve for this thing to even be able to, to, for a user to log in. And we'd start that out on, um, we use, the great thing about the cloud is it's great for sizing and stuff like that. So we started out on AWS with um, small instances, we have a baseline test for that, and then we work way up with, uh, we'll say, two small instances, two medium instances, two large, and so forth. And then we go back to the beginning and we say, okay, I'll try before. So we would be able to determine at the end of it, okay, well, actually, having two medium instances is better than having one large, and so forth. Uh, so that's how we determined those numbers through trial and error effectively. And so we, we'd be able to go to the DevOps guys at the end of the day and say, look, we need to procure two medium instances, four gigs around each, et cetera, et cetera, and uh, we need to. We know basically that we can we can we have capacity to run. Uh, we'll say the sweet number we found was about somewhere between 50 and 75, maybe 100. Any running instances of microservices within the, the one uh, container. Um, and then, as regards your second question, then you mentioned uh, scaling out the fleet. Do you mean uh, do you mean scaling out the, the machines themselves, the VMs? Yeah, uh, before you even if you know that that's your limit. Sure. So why can you not just add more hosts? Or more? Or more VMs to handle even before to handle the load even before you get to your threshold. Great question. Thanks for asking. Yeah, I should have gone through that as well. One of the things this sort of pertains the, to the business side of things too, and selling to the business. Um, the company I worked for, where we implemented this stuff first, uh, they were absolutely not on board to go with this stuff. Um, so. 
one of the, I suppose, the sweetness for the deal was that uh, I like claimed that we could be ultra frugal with this stuff. We would save a lot of money. So um, the whole point was that this stuff ideally was going to work in Java, uh, so that it could run on Unix, um, specifically because those instances are cheaper in the cloud. And um, effectively, I said, look, we can we can have uh, potentially ultra small instances on Linux running here simultaneously pushed to the absolute max without going over to limits and operating within 80 to 90 percent of their capacity. So we can basically get them. Our application will be, I suppose, down to, down to within within 5 or 10 percent of CPU capacity uh, efficient in terms of so we can reduce cost. And I think we I think we reduce. I think the costs. Uh, I, I think I think they were one twentieth or something what they were currently costing to run. And uh, of course, when the when the accountants and so forth, the finance people heard that, uh, they were all over. So uh, <laughs> um, it was more of a. It was as much a strategic move as well as a technical move in terms of. I wonder can we actually do this before we start scaling out? Um, so I suppose that's the most that's the most uh, thorough and honest way I can answer that question. Great. Sorry. Uh, you said something about a connection pool of queues. Yeah, yeah. So the thing is, when you have a connection pool, you can test the connection to see if it's still alive, and it's not alive, but turn the connection to the pool. How do you handle the situation where, for some exception, the thread gets killed, and then you are not able to return the queue to the pool? Sorry. Oh no, you're fine, thanks. I'm just trying to... I wrote this thing about two years ago, so uh, I'm just trying to visualize the damn code in my head. Um, there was... oh yeah, there's um, uh, an asynchronous event handler. One thing I would say about .NET is that it has, um, in this day and age, the latest thing in, in incarnation has uh, superb multi-threading and asynchronous handling. For example, uh, it handles a lot of the stuff in terms of the CPU. It'll take... Uh, are you a .NET programmer? No, no, no. Okay, okay, good. I see you nodding your head there. Like, hey, yeah, come on, get on, get on. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know, I know that it's very good with asynchronous programming. And yeah. It's very good. Program. Yeah, so effectively, we get a lot of that stuff out of the box. I did mention that the queue pool is thread safe, so no, no process is going to take the same queue out, and uh, it's very easy to lock that down to apply uh, mutually, excu mutually exclusive lock locks in .NET. And similarly, there is an event that fires in the queue pool uh, pertaining to that queue, such that if the queue dies, a general exception is caught. And it's returned back, and um, that queue will effectively be returned to the pool um, after a specific timeout occurs. Again, um, this is all on uh, the, the, that uh, GitHub repository. Um, I'm happy to point you to the code afterwards if you like specifically. Oh, perfect. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. Time for one more question. Regarding um, yeah. uh, the security of the, well, the resilience on, on in terms of how you get the message back and the return queue, yeah. what happens if you don't? I mean, what happens with that queue? Uh, the failure, the, 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 the service processing that message on, on the other end might just fail. You might just not get anything back. Right? Absolutely. Uh, let me just, for simplicity's sake, skip quickly back to that one. Uh, da, 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 da. Yeah, here we are. So, um, as a, so let me just see if I understand the question right. So, uh, the request comes in, we get a queue from our queue pool, whether it exists or not, and the message is processed. The microservice gets the message with the, the queue name intact, and it goes, okay, he wants to send this message to queue zero one. And uh, what happened with that? He said the message never it never gets sent out. Well, at this point, all of the microservice simply has a, um, an ID pertaining to the queue. It's not actually done anything with it yet. So if some failure occurs here, uh, effectively no message will be sent out. Um, so what happens is the only the only resource that's holding a lock on that queue at the moment is the ASP.NET app because what it does is it um, releases it, it invokes the message first of all and immediately after invoking the message it will take the queue that it's gotten from queue pool and it will sit there and hold it continuously in the background until uh, until such a time that the microservice downstream here returns a message to it and uh, there's a specific uh, predefined timeout associated with that polling so if for example after 30 seconds uh, no message has appeared on that queue it's uh, it's released back into queue pool cool that's it all right, no problem. Thanks very much.